following program is intended for mature audiences. The time is now for the hardest hit, yet completely trivial, football show on the planet. You are in rarefied territory. Ladies and gentlemen, well, well to the broken helmet. Let's rock. Coming to you live on tape on this Monday, September 13th, the day we have all been waiting for. It is season eight of Fortnite. I know. Sorry, sorry, sorry. My kids are super juiced. They're super juiced. They're very excited for the first day of season eight of Fortnite. I, I get it, I get it, I get it. For the rest of us, it is now the conclusion of the first Sunday of football for the 2021 season. Very exciting. All the way around. Not sure it was the best football, but we've come to kind of be accustomed to that in the first weeks of the season. You know, see, weeks one through four is more or less the preseason for the actual season, even though the preseason already took place. I know. I don't get it either. But that's the way that it works out, because nobody plays anybody in the preseason. So that's what happens. But we did get some good games. We got some stinkers. We got, I guess, a shocker here and there. You know, overall, it was fun to watch. Some of the better teams came out and played well. The Chiefs-Browns game ended up being a good one. They uh, ended up battling down to a Kansas City win, 33-29, but it took the whole game to get there. A uh, screwed-up punt late in the game helped to cement that victory for Kansas City. Elsewhere, you had the Miami Dolphins eking out a 17-16 game in the NFC battle, NFC East battle, that is, versus the Patriots. That game up in Gillette, Dolphins taking a home loss right there with Mac Jones performing well, but still not enough to get the victory. Tua, obviously, it was his first go-round in his second season. He did all right, not, not great, I don't think. Arizona opened a can of whoop-ass on the Titans. Game over, man. Yeah, Game it was over. a slaughter early, and it never got any better. Arizona wins that one on the road over there in Nissan Stadium. Final score, 38-13. Trying to think of some of these other ones that were notable. Houston were underdogs at home versus Jacksonville. Now under the guidance of Urban Meyer who is going to resurrect that program with the number one draft pick, Trevor Lawrence. And it got off to a terrible start as they ended up losing to Houston. Texans victorious 37-21. Pittsburgh on the road. Pittsburgh, everybody writing, writing them off. They have a new offense under Matt Canada, and he ended up helping them Cement a victory by the score of 23-16, although that one ended with uh, more or less in the fourth quarter a turnover that led to a touchdown. So I'm not sure if it was necessarily Matt Canada, but people were excited to see what that offense was going to contribute. You didn't get a whole heck of a lot in that game. The old Ben Roethlisberger ended up going 18 for 32 for 188 and a touchdown. Not super, but enough to get it done on the road. Uh, On the other side of the ball, I guess that's the bigger shocker, is that Josh Allen there, the loser of that battle, was 30 for 51 for 270 and a touchdown. Did suffer three sacks, so the Pittsburgh defense, staying true to form, being able to put pressure on the quarterback. 49ers ended up winning 
quite big, 41-33 over the Lions. That game was actually more of a runaway at one point. I think it was 41-17, and then the Lions actually came back at the end there. 49ers continued to uh, suffer injuries in that game. It was one after another. Um, so they lost They lost their starting running back, Mosert. And the funny thing about that was that Trey Sermon, who was drafted high up to back him up, was a healthy scratch. But it didn't matter because then they turned over to Elijah Mitchell, uh, another rookie running back, and he ended up going 19 for 104 in a touchdown. Go figure. And like Debo Samuel also blew up in that game when he had nine catches for a buck 89 in a touchdown. So those were some of the games that took place on this first week of the NFL season. Let's check out all of the gambling stats. And it looked as though we were going to get dogs when the week started, and that only compounded itself as time went on. It turned out that it was all dogs this week. The final dogs 11 favorites for dogs actually won eight of those 11 games so this week if you were on the money line with dogs there was a lot of parlay money to be had if you picked out those dogs correctly Um, those dog winners off the top here the cardinals were a dog winner the chargers the texans the steelers the bengals the Eagles, the Saints, and Dolphins. All of those eight teams were all dog covers. So if you had any of those two, three, four put together, you, my friend, were making some money this weekend. As for the home dogs, the home dogs this week were four and two, with the Texans, Bengals, and Saints all winning as a home dog, and then the Lions covering as the home dog. Uh, Down to the over-unders, it ended up being 7-8 to in favor of the unders in this one. And then when we move over to the teases, we will start with the underdogs versus the favorites. The favorites teased this week were 8, 5, and 2. That's right, we got two pushes. Those pushes ended up being the Bucks and Cowboys, and the Vikings and Bengals ended up being a push as well. As for the dogs, the teased dogs were 12 and 3 this week. So they were the big winner when looking at all the teases, that being the favorites, dogs, overs, and unders. The dogs were a big 12 and 3. If you were looking for the games that worked teased either way, whether it was favorites or dogs, there was one, two, three, four, five of them this week. Those games ended up being the Chargers Redskins game, the Panthers Jets game, the 49ers Lions game, Chiefs Browns, Patriots Dolphins. If you teased Either side in those games, you ended up being victorious. Job well done by you. As for the overs and the unders, the teased overs this week were 9 and 6. The teased unders were 11 and 4. So obviously this week we're looking at the dogs and the unders as the plays to be. If you were looking for games over unders that were teased that won either way, you were looking at the Titans and Cardinals game, the Seahawks and Colts, the Vikings, Bengals, Broncos, Giants, and Rams, Bears all hit it right through the goalposts. So those teases were good either way. So, you know, you look at it this week and you got to say, hey, it was a dog week. That's just basically what it was. I mean, it started that way from the very beginning with the Thursday night game when the Cowboys came in and covered that game and went all the way down the line. You know, I don't know if that ends up being trend worthy based on all the stats that we did last year. And historically, things end up being more or less 50-50. So I'm not saying it is a coin flip, but if there is edges, they're tough to come by. That's why this is a tough sport, that being the NFL season of gambling. Uh, It is very difficult to pull off, and a lot of people claim that they uh, know more than they do. But I'll tell you what, from watching it, tracking it, and looking at these finals and how they end up 
scoring against the odds makers in Vegas. It is a very difficult game, my friends. But anyway, the dogs this week went right down. I mean, you know, the Cowboys ended up coming in and they covered when they played the Tampa Bay tough. The Cardinals were underdogs by three and just outright kicked the shit out of the Titans in that game. That was 38 to 13. The other dogs, the Chargers came in. That was a screwy game, right? Because the Chargers originally were favored, and then Austin Eckler went out, and that moved the line quite a bit, put the Redskins up as the favorite in that game. They end up losing Fitzpatrick to a hip injury. Go figure. An old fucking guy like Fitzpatrick gets a hip injury. Maybe there's a hurricane waiting for you when you get home. Um, So that ends up being a, a, a... Kind of a crazy game because if you think about it, it, you probably would have went with the Chargers constantly. But, man, people were all over these Redskins for all summer long. The front four, this, that, and the rest. And then ends up being that the Chargers won. They only won by four, but it was a dog win. Uh, The Texans ended up having a dog win, too, because they defended their home ground versus the Jaguars. Again, this Jaguars experiment is going to be fun to watch in one way, shape, or form. Because while you might get great stats out of the Jaguars, I mean, specifically in this game, I think Lawrence had over 300 yards. Looking at it here, he was, well, it wasn't accurate at all. Lawrence ended up being 28 for 51 for 332, three touchdowns, and three picks. So he was Mr. Throw the Ball all over the damn place, regardless of accuracy or what the end result was. But Urban Meyer brought the Jaguars in as a three-point favorite and then ended up getting smoked by 16 points in that one. So that was ugly. The Steelers were a dog win, like we said. They had that uh, big defensive stand. That, that game turned late in the uh, late in the game. Fourth quarter, I think, is where the turn was there. But Steelers were six-and-a-half-point dogs and ended up winning by a touchdown. Cincinnati was three-point dogs. They ended up winning by the field goal in the end in overtime. Philadelphia, the Eagles. Now, the Falcons were at home. Falcons had an entire new regime in there taking over for Dan Quinn, who ends up leaving to go and be the D.C. with Dallas after he got shit-canned. But Atlanta comes in there. They bring in uh, Arthur Smith, you know, the offensive mind for the Titans, and they think everything's going, you know, they're going to turn it around. Dan Pease they bring back to be the D.C., and maybe they should have put him back in retirement, which I'm almost positive he came from retirement because their defense stunk, and that team's offense was no good. So I don't know what you know happened from the Tennessee uh, blueprint that they tried to instill here, but it did not work. Philadelphia mopped up on the Falcons 32-16. to That was a 26-point swing. So they going in, Eagles underdogs by three and a half, and you win by 26. Boom. I mean, shit. And it was an under, too, because the Eagles only scored six points. I'm like, what the fuck, dude? You know, Calvin Ridley, you know, uh, I, I, disappointment? I don't know. I mean, I think everybody in that team was a disappointment because they just didn't do anything. Nothing at all. What happened to the captain of the ship under center? Uh, Well, Matt Ryan did all of 21 for 35 for 164. I mean, that is car crash multiplied by duty. Not as bad as uh, another old-timer, a really old-timer. We haven't even got to that game quite yet. So the Lions ended up covering. Uh, 49ers went up big. They were mopping up, and then the Lions ended up coming back in that game. The Lions ended up losing um, uh, the de- uh, defensive lineman at one point. I think he went out, and then he was declared out for the game, and I think they were afraid he might have suffered a torn ACL. I take that back. It is not an ACL because it looks like the Lions' Jeff Okuda could have suffered an Achilles injury. So that is the word out of there. Meanwhile, the 49ers on the other side, they got decimated as well. Their cornerback, Jason Verrett, he went down with a likely ACL. Screwy deal with him and a brutal pill to swallow because he's been in the league four years and he's played all of six games. So he's had injury after injury. It was an Achilles. It was an ACL. He came back, played decent last year, he signed a one-year deal. He got about $5.5 million, and now he's out because it looks like he uh, he injured his 
ACL, which is going to be compounded because it was the ACL. The, there was an ACL that he injured previously. I don't know offhand if it was the same ACL, but he's going to be out for the year regardless. Now, the 49ers were also thin at cornerback because they were short. One of their starters, Emmanuel Mosley, was out. So he misses week with a knee injury. They think they're going to get him back next week. They also are going to get Josh Norman, who they just brought in. Uh, and he'll be into practice this week, and they're hoping that he'll get to play. At the end of this game today, they actually had a rookie and a practice squad call-up player playing corner, which probably goes to show why the Lions were able to turn that game around and actually make it somewhat competitive at the end after being down 41 to whatever, 17 or whatnot. So, And the 49ers also lost Raheem Mosert in that game to a knee injury, which was complicated by the fact that Trey Sermon, the rookie they drafted in the third round, was inactive. Healthy scratch. So they turned over to Elijah Manuel, Elijah Mitchell. He stepped in, and then what did he do? Oh, he just ran for oh, 19 for 105 for and a touchdown. So 100 yards out of the rookie who they didn't even draft to be the guy. It was Trey Sermon, but ended up uh, – Ended up uh, sitting on the sideline there. Uh, Healthy scratch for Sermon. Mitchell comes in to save the day. Dre Dre Greenlaw, if you saw this during the game, Dre Greenlaw is a linebacker. He had a pick six of Jared Goff, who ended up being Goffle at this point. And Greenlaw should have been flagged for that one. No joke. That should have been an easy flag because he pieced out, gave the peace out sign to the Lions as he was running into the end zone. But it turns out that karma got him in the end because he suffered a groin injury on that 39-yard pick six. So the 49ers there uh, ended up winning, but it was the Lions that had the dog victory. Uh, The Browns ended up having a dog cover. They were playing on the road versus the Chiefs, played them close all the way through. I don't know what the hell that sound was that I just made with my mouth. But uh, they played them all the way through. The Giants got destroyed at home. A terrible outing for the for the Giants. I mean, really just piss poor in, in all regards, all phases of the game. Uh, the Broncos went in there, and Teddy Bridgewater just mopped up on them. I mean, the biggest shock from that Giants game was that the Giants' defense looked terrible, and that was supposed to be, like, the part, the one phase of their game that was awesome was their defense. They even added to it in the offseason with Dory Jackson, and didn't show, didn't happen on this Sunday. The Saints were on the road as a home team in Jacksonville, And they ended up winning. That was a dog win right there as they thoroughly destroyed the Packers. And that was the quarterback that I mentioned previously that really played horrendously. And that was the great pissy face himself, Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers' final line for this game, 15 for 28 for 130 and two interceptions. ESPN's uh, QBR or whatever rating that is had him at 36.8. 36.8, which was the lowest of the entire week. And if you want to look to find the next closest QBR to Aaron Rodgers, 36.8, you have to go all the way to Trevor Lawrence. So the rookie quarterback in Jacksonville that went 28 for 51 with three picks, he was about, whatever, 30 points better than the great Aaron Rodgers. Green Bay got gets thumped in this game. New Orleans 38 to 3, 35 points over the Green Bay Packers to lock that one up. The Dolphins and Patriots like we said, that one was a super close one. A one point victory for the Dolphins there, good for the dog win. And then if you didn't get to watch the night game, the Rams really manhandled the Bears. I I know at one point there it was a 6-point game, I think, 20 to 14. Um, but it really was not that close. I, the Bears have problems all over the place, primarily with that offensive line. They brought Jason Peters in, who is all of 67 years old, and put him at starting tackle. He ends up going out of the game. And then when he leaves the game, he's replaced by a rookie. 
And then that rookie, whose name is, let me find it here, Larry Barham, he ended up going out too. So both those linemen, one being a, a you know a, a super old one that they brought in from fishing, I think they were talking about during the broadcast, um, go out. So I don't know what the, what the Bears are doing there. I know Bear fans are really not happy with the situation, and why would you be? Uh, as a Giant fan, I, I can relate. Uh, but the Bears, what are they going to do? Even if they br- do the switch and they put Dalton on the bench, which is just going to be the talk until Dalton is on the bench. It's one of the unfortunate things about this situation is that the Bears didn't think thoroughly enough about starting, not starting a QB and going out and getting a, a journeyman when the journeyman quarterback you know is just going to get blasted from the get-go. Like, what kind of position are you putting him in? And then how is that going to help? You're not going to be able to just sit on Justin Fields for weeks and weeks and weeks. No way. That shit ain't happening because those fans are going to riot if you don't put Fields in. And, I mean, unless Dalton turns around and ends up going on like a four or five game win streak, which how are you going to do that if you have Jason Peters starting as your right tackle, left tackle, wherever he was today? Uh, it just It's an impossibility. And their defense, which used to be a strong part of that team, has more or less peeled away over the years. And you're one stand, they, they tried to bill Khalil Mack as this standout defensive player. And I love Khalil Mack. I was a huge fan of him coming out of college. I loved when he was on the Raiders. My Raiders, my brother is a Raiders fan. I got him a Khalil Mack jersey. I thought it was a great jersey. And I thought he was going to be there forever. It just made sense. Everything about it made sense. And then they ended up trading him and he went to the Bears. And slowly, if you watch him on the Bears, it's not even the same. And I know that they put the stats up with him and Aaron Donald tonight. And if you look at it, they couldn't have been any different a player. Now, when you're talking about pressures, I think it was 700 to 786 in favor of Donald. So Donald had like 80-plus more pressures or quarterback pressures than Khalil Mack, and this was since 2014. But then you watch during the game, and, I mean, Mack more or less, maybe he's a factor in the strategy going into a game where the defensive coordinators you know, have to pay attention to him. And I'm sure he'll have a game where he'll have two sacks or whatever. But if you look at him play, he is just not anywhere close to what he was when he was with the Raiders and then his first year with the Bears. And it just shows. I mean, sometimes players just go, and they just get old really quick. And, I, you know, maybe there's something else that I'm missing. But, man, every time I watch him and I try to see if Khalil Max got that extra gear and something left to give, I, I just i am sorely disappointed with – uh, not a lot of performance out of him. But anyway, the Bears end up going in there. They they get it to 2016 at one point, and then it was just all Rams after that, 34-14. to 14. Uh, They end up winning by 20, and uh, they were good for the over as well. Um, let me see if there was any kind of injuries that I missed. We touched on Fitzpatrick and his hip injury. Um, oh, the Jets, they, they lost to the... Panthers in Carolina, nineteen to fourteen, and they also lost Mackay Be- Becton in this one with a knee injury. And I mean, Becton is great when he can stay on the field. Usually, the guys always hurt, <gasps> always hurt, always hurt. And once again, he goes down, and now they're going to have to figure out, you know, how long he's going to be out with that injury. And speaking of other linemen that are <gasps> hurt. Patriots right tackle Trent Brown went down on the first drive. So they trade for this guy. They get him in there. First drive, done. Finito goes out with a calf injury. He was in the, he was replaced by Justin Haran. And then Justin Haran, Haran did so good, he was replaced by Yasir Durant. I mean, who they just traded for from the Chiefs. So, if you want to know how things are going with the Patriots and their offensive line, which is usually a strong point. Um, They are having all problems now with Trent Brown down, and they're going to have to solidify something there uh, in order to protect Mac Brown and keep these numbers up. So, 
uh, all in all, a solid first week of football. I really think that, I mean, to me, the biggest shocker of them all was probably the Packers just getting lit up on the road versus New Orleans. I And not that I couldn't see New Orleans winning. I mean, they, they do have talent on both sides of the ball. Like Jameis Winston was a big question mark in my my mind. But I just did not see New Orleans going in there and throwing up all of three points. I mean, that, that, that well, they didn't go to New Orleans, right? They went in Jacksonville. You know what I mean. The Packers are basically the same team as last year, right? I mean, there's not, there's not a whole lot of turnover in that part. And, you know, they're bringing people back like Reggie Cobb to try to make a piece to, uh, to Aaron Rodgers. You know, ego, and still, it didn't matter. You know, Pissy Face had a terrible game, and the Packers had a terrible game, and 38-3 to to a team for a team who many thought could be an NFC championship contender and represent the NFC in the Super Bowl. Well, I mean, you know, you compare the Tampa Bay Buccaneers to the Green Bay Packers after week one, and you see a very stark difference between the two of them. Um, elsewhere, if there was any, let's see if there's anything else. No, not really. You know, that was, that was kind of it, you know, Kansas city, the Browns were, was a good game. That one, uh, fit the bill. Uh, the, the saints and the Packers did not. So, all right. Uh, week one in the books, that was the quick breakdown of the, uh, gambling home dogs, the teases. And the rest, let's flip over and do our Guess the Line segment. And this is what we do. This is done now by basically everybody. I decided to jump in on on the bandwagon and follow along because, hell, why not, right? Everybody ends up taking the games. They try to guess the lines, and then they match them against what against what Vegas is doing. And then, obviously, if there is some kind of discrepancy between the two, Maybe there's some arbitrage there. Maybe something that you can, some kind of edge that you can exploit. And it's done by everybody. A lot of people really like the uh, the rendition that is done on Bill Simmons' podcast. The Gil Anderson, or Gil Alexander, he does a similar guessing the lines, which is pretty good. I mean, you're a pick of the litter. I do it for the fun of it, just like everybody else. So, without further ado... Here we go. So, we have the first game this week, which is going to be the Thursday night game. Giants at Redskins. So, looking at this, the Giants' performance was so poor that even with the Redskins not having a quarterback and uh, having a questionable performance versus the Chargers, I'm going to go this one. The Giants... By, uh, Giants are going to be dogs in this one. Redskins favored by three and a half. And close I was as the line opening was three points. Currently, it has gotten juiced up. So since the Giants played so horrifically today, the three point line has increased a whole point and a half. So if there was any edge that you thought you might have there, Rich is stupid. The Giants were so bad they should easily be four and a half or five. Well, guess what? Um, They are. So while I thought uh, I I matched the opening line, I did not match the current go-around as the current go-around is four and a half. The Bengals are going to travel to Chicago and face off against the Bears. The Bears had a really stupid Dinky night. I am going to actually give the Bengals the nod here because I just, I know the Bengals are not great. I know the Browns, the Bears are not great. The Bears are at home at Soldier Field. Dalton didn't look terrible. Montgomery did look good. But, you know, the Bengals, Joe Burrow looked good. They played the Vikings hard. They won in overtime. So I'm going to give the nod here to the Bengals and I'm going to make it light. I'm just going to go two points Bengals favored. And I was flat out wrong as the Bears opened as four point favorites in this one. So I was completely on the wrong side of this one. So the Delta there, I I was wrong by six points. And currently, it's come down half a point. So 
the opening line was four. It is currently Bears three and a half. So if you're like me and you think the Bengals should be favored in that one, possibly there is some edge there if you like the Bengals. The next game on the docket is going to be the Texans at the Browns. Browns hosting this one after they played the Kansas City Chiefs pretty tight. Texans had a decent game. Granted, it was versus a bad Jacksonville team. So I'm going to give the Browns the favorite here. And I'm going to make them, let's make them a pretty hefty favorite. I'm going to go six here. So we're going to go Browns by six. Not quite a touchdown. You know, the Texans did put up points this weekend, 37 of them to be exact. So I'll go Browns by six. Six or six and a half. Let's let's just keep it at six. And... I was again wrong on this one because the line opened at 11 and a half. Not only that, it's up to 13 and a half. So people are pounding the Bear Browns, pounding the Browns right now. So, I mean, if you if you are a Texan fan and believe that they can stay in this game, I think 13 and a half is a lot of points. I mean, the Texans did play Okay today. I, I have not watched the, the game in full yet, but man, to make the Browns a 13 and a half point favorite um, against a Texans team that just scored 37 points, I mean, that, that means the Jaguars. They must think shit of the Jaguars. Jesus, if they're going to, uh, you know, value the Texans win to a 13 and a half underdog spread versus the Browns. Woof. Go figure. Uh, Rams and Colts are the next game. This game is going to be played in Indianapolis. Now, the Colts uh, had an okay game, not a great one. They ended up getting beat deep a bunch by Seattle as Russell Wilson hit Tyler Lockett, I think, for two bombs in today's game. So I'm going to make the Rams the favorite. They just played Sunday night, and they look good against the Bears at home. So I'll make them a four-point favorite in this one. And the line ended up being only one and a half to open. So I was way over what the Vegas opening line was. But if you look at what it currently is, it's moved to two and a half. So now it's gone it's gone up a full point from Rams one, minus one and a half to Rams favored by two and a half, which is one and a half off of my four. I would imagine that as time goes on here, you might see maybe a move to minus three. In that one, that's just my guess. But as uh, as you see, the Rams, uh, I, I was a little bit heavier on them. I like the Rams. I, I mean, the Colts played okay at home. You get another home game here, but the Rams looked really good today. I, I, I might like that line there at two and a half, and even at three, if it uh, if it gets up there. The Bills will travel into Miami and face off against the Dolphins. Bills obviously coming off of that loss at home to the Steelers, which was kind of a weird game. The Dolphins getting that win versus the uh, Patriots, which is a weird game in itself. I'm still going to go with the Bills in this one, even though they're on the road and they lost at home. Uh, I'm going to make them just a measly field goal field goal uh, favorite here against the Dolphins in, at Hard Rock Stadium. And I was almost on the money here as it is two and a half uh, in favor of the Bills. So I was a half point off, and that line has actually now moved a full point. So the Bills are now favored by a touchdown and the hook uh, as they face off against Miami. The Jets are going to host the Pats. So the Jets are going to get an NFC East. So here between these two games, Bills at Dolphins and Pats at Jets, you get the entire NFC East facing off against each other. So the Jets at MetLife Stadium, they played okay against uh, Matt Rule and the Panthers. They're never going to be the favorites here at home. Um, You know, is the Pats line issue going to be a factor? I don't think so. Let's make them a little bit more than the field goal. Let's go three and a half for the pass. And the opening line was actually four. So close, but not close enough. And the line has actually now come back down to three and a half. So almost on the money with that one. The 49ers and Eagles are going to be facing off against each other. And this one is just, I mean, fireworks city based on last week's games. 49ers throwing up 40 and change. 
Orange Eagles throwing up almost 40. Uh, well, I guess not quite. They throw up 32. Um, but anyway, the high-scoring teams of last week are going to be facing off in Philadelphia. I'm still going to lean 49ers in this one. I'm not going to go too high because the Eagles at home. Let's do 49ers by less than a field goal. Let's give them two points. And the opening line actually was four points, so I was under there. But the current line is now at three points. So that line has moved up. So it's right now one point different from where I guessed it to from versus where it opened. So either one of us right there in the middle there at about field goal in favor of the 49ers. The Saints and Panthers are going to square off. They're going to look to battle in North Carolina. Panthers got the home game here. I'm going to go Saints as the favorite because they really walloped on the Green Bay. They beat the shit out of them. So the Panthers eked out a win versus the Jets. Sam Darnold looked good, not great. I think the Saints look better, so I'll give the Saints the... Favorite on the road. Let's do eh, not. Do I want to give them the full three? No, I'm going to give them two and a half, and it ends up being two. So right there, I was close, and the line currently has moved from that two. So the line currently now is at three. So the betters coming in heavy on the Saints after their performance this Sunday. The Raiders-Steelers will be squaring off. They'll be fighting each other right there at, I don't even, I was just about to call it Three Rivers. Shows you where the hell I'm at. No, sorry about that, guys. So they're going to be playing at Heinz Field. And I think that the Steelers will get the nod here. Even though the Raiders have not played it, maybe they look great tomorrow night. But I'm going to make the Steelers a pretty hefty favorite because now that they've won, they're a, a a, a big national kind of team. So I'm going to give them five points. Five points at home versus the Raiders. And the opening line was five and a half, which has now pounded itself up an entire point and reached six and a half. So right now the Steelers becoming almost a seven-point favorite over the Raiders in Pittsburgh. Vikings and Cardinals are on the docket. The Vikings will have to travel to State Farm Stadium for this one. Cardinals get a home game after their big win on the road in Tennessee. Cardinals, I'm going to make a favorite by three and a half. And the opening line was two and a half, so I was a point off. And it currently has gone all the way up to four and a half. So that's a full two-point move off the opening line, even above what I thought it was. People not liking what they saw out of the Vikings and really liking what they saw out of the Cardinals. People have been waiting for this Cliff Kingsbury experiment to really take flight. And maybe last weekend was the beginning of those uh, people reaching that expectation. So that line, again, currently Cardinals by four and a half. The Broncos and Jaguars. So here you're going to have a, a crazy scenario where the Jaguars were everybody's darling going into week one. The Broncos also a darling, but not as much as the Jaguars versus the Texans. Jaguars put up the stink fest. They get throttled. Broncos go in and completely fulfill expectations on their end. So I'm going to go Broncos here. Now they're on the road. Do I give them a lot of points? Because, I mean, this is one where Vegas could kind of favor the Broncos by quite a bit. But you know what? They really did like the Jaguars. So let's do on the road, uh, road favorite. Let's give them two and a half, not quite the three. And it ended up being two and a half. So that was the opening line. But if we look at the current line, the betters have went all the way with the Broncos, loved what they saw, didn't like what the Jaguars saw, so now the line is six points. So the Broncos are almost favored seven points on the road versus the Jaguars. Nobody, nobody is liking the Urban Meyer experiment after week one. That is for sure. Because let me tell you, I saw the Bronco-Giants game, and did the Broncos play well? Yeah, okay, they played well. 
that game was all about the Giants stinking up the goddamn joint. So for the Broncos then to turn around and turn that into extra points in Vegas, I mean, kudos. But I'll be watching to see what happens with this line. I have a feeling that this might be one that people jump in later on the Jaguars with the six points at home. The Falcons and Buccaneers are going to battle each other. I, I keep saying the same <laughs> fucking things. You know, face off, battle each other, uh, duke it out, you know, whatever. So the Falcons, Buccaneers, they're going to be playing in Tampa Bay. Uh, Falcons get throttled. The Buccaneers have a great game. So, I, I mean, Buccaneers 7.5. Let's go 7.5. Uh, you know, you probably the highest one this week, I think, was that 49er spread, which went all the way up to nine. I don't know if they're going to get there yet. The Buccaneers still have a little bit of offense that I assume that you think could hit at any certain point. I mean, Calvin Ridley's no joke. So uh, let, let's go up to seven and a half. And the opening line was eight and a half. But my read is terrible because even though I was only a point off on the opening line, it has been pounded all the way up to 12 and a half in favor of the Buccaneers. So right away, this is the second or third line, if you will. I guess four, fourth big line. Second line that I am completely wrong about because the Falcons-Buccaneers, which I thought was going to be about a seven-point game is 12 and a half so I was five points off there which is almost ideal well not not almost identical it's not identical at all I was also wrong about the Texans and the Browns that the Browns would be favored by six and a half and that game is currently at 13 and a half so the Broncos Jaguars is the third when that was opened at two and a half and has moved to six but right now the Browns the Broncos and the Buccaneers are just getting don't say pounded upon, Rich. Don't say pounded upon. You are a stupid <laughs> asshole. That's exactly what he is. I can't help it. I can't help it. I think it's part of it's because it's late. The other part is because I'm trying to do this and I haven't really thought out a good process for it. So I'm just using the same cliches. I'm a cliche monster. I'm a fucking monster. <laughs> With these. But anyway, um... So, uh, Buccaneers, Falcons, Buccaneers right now favored by seven and a half. And like I was trying to say, people coming in very heavily on the Browns, the Buccaneers, and the Broncos so far. Uh, the next game up is the Cowboys and Chargers. Cowboys, they'll probably be favored on the road on this one because they did play really well against the Buccaneers, and the Chargers were okay, but they only got a four-point win versus a Washington team who had no quarterback. They had to go to Taylor Heineke or whatever uh, after Fitzy went down. So I'm going to give the Cowboys a three-point uh, road favorite here. And, well, that wasn't the one. That was the one I wanted. Uh, and the drum roll leads to me being quite... <laughs> as not only are the Cowboys not the favorite, the Chargers are the favorite by one and a half. So I am a full four and a half points wrong on that one. Although it has come back a full half a point. <laughs> so <laughs> It doesn't salvage my terrible pick. But the uh, Cowboys are now underdogs by two and a half instead of the one and a half that it started with. So uh, people are filling in on the chart. Is that even possible? No way. So, I, I mean, the Cowboys, really? The Cowboys are not going to be a favorite in that game. That's amazing. And it's amazing that the Chargers are actually moving up in that game. I guess maybe because they lost Lyle Collins. And they lost, uh, and they lost Michael Gallup. But I don't. Do you think that would really result in people's expectations getting lowered for the Cowboys on the road? Uh, anyway, looks like the Chargers are going to be the favorite in that one, up to two and a half right now, as it stands at about one o'clock on Monday morning. The Seahawks and Titans will face each other in Week Two. This game will be at. Seattle, and I am going to give Seattle a four and a half point favorite line here. And it was three and a half, which has now gone up to five and a half. So I was wrong on either count. I was, uh, I was 
ahead by a point, and now I'm down by a point based on current betting. So that game, also people coming in on the Seahawks, which makes sense since the Titans really stunk up the field versus Arizona. Chiefs and Ravens, which could have been a really good game had the Ravens not lost their entire team to injury. All this week, it was nothing but injury and injury and injury. ACL, 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 Achilles, shoulder, PP. I mean, it was everything. So the Ravens end up uh, getting beat up. So I'm going to make the Chiefs a favorite here. I'm going to make them, I mean, people really like the Ravens. I can't go too heavy. I'm going to go four and a half. And the opening line was one. So I went way too heavy in this one. Uh, that line, all though that line has moved up. So now the opening line was one. The current line is two and a half. So that move up has gone a point and a half. So people coming in on the Chiefs as well. And then the that's that game, by the way, is going to be a Sunday nighter. And that leaves us with the Monday night football game. And that game is going to be the Lions and the Packers. Complete stink fest in this one. Packers are still going to be the favorite in this one. I don't care how bad they played last week versus New Orleans. They're going to be favored here. I am going to make them a seven-point favorite. And the opening line was 10. I was not high enough. So the opening line was 10, which has moved up to 10 and a half. So there you got it. If you want to look at... Where I was wrong with the spreads, I got a couple of games really wrong. That being the Bengals and the Bears in that one. I thought the Bengals were going to be favored. I couldn't have been more wrong. The Bears were favored by four, currently sitting at three and a half. I was also wrong with the Texans and the Browns. In that game, I was giving the Texans way more credit than anybody else was. Vegas has that game at 13.5 currently. I came in at 6.5 in favor of the Browns. The other stinkaroos that I had, um, 49 Eagles was a two-point. I I made the 49ers only two-point favorites, and that line ended up being four. Not that big of a deal. The Cowboys line I was really wrong at. I thought that the Cowboys were going to be favored in that one, and they are currently the underdogs. I thought they'd be favored by a field goal. They're the underdogs by almost a field goal, so that's a complete flip of the game that I was predicting. And then the other game I was wrong with would have been the Lions and the Packers, as I had the Packers a 7-point favorite. They're actually a 10.5-point favorite in that one. Another game that actually got away from me, although it wasn't compared to the lead line, but where the game moved since was the Falcons-Buccaneers. I was giving the Buccaneers about a field goal and the hook, and that game has flown all the way up the boards to 12 and a half. Shit you not, 12 and a half. So people really have cashed out on the Falcons, and it's only week two. Not what you want to see. So anyway, that is the Guessing the Lines show for week two. Uh, we did a little recap. The first time we're kind of going through this Sunday night uh, extravaganza. So we got a little improvements to make. And we'll see how it goes. We'll figure out how to make it a little bit of a better listen. After I listen to it myself, critique it, and they say, Oh, Rich, what the fuck were you doing? That sucked. Uh, We will fix it and make it all that more enjoyable for your listening pleasure. Anyway, until then, enjoy the rest of your Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, or whatever. Peace. Peace.